I'm from a think tank called Demos. So if you're not familiar with think tanks, I think lots of people outside of politics probably aren't. Demos is one of probably about half a dozen political think tanks washing around in, in Westminster. And our job, we're technically a public education charity, is to try and put as much new ideas, new evidence, new research into the hands of decision makers and policy makers as we possibly can. Um, so it's a little bit daunting for a poor think tanker to come to, a, to the academy to talk about social media research methods, but that's what I'm going to be trying to do in the next 20 minutes. And my bit of Demos, Demos works on lots of different areas of major kind of public policy making concern. We work on uh, public finance reform, on welfare, on civic uh, participation and politics. Uh, but my bit of Demos is that, the Centre for the Analysis of Social Media. About four and a half years old now, it's primarily been dedicated to two things really. Firstly, understanding how the rise of digital platforms, digital world, social media is changing society, how it's changing who we think we are, it's changing the problems that we see in society and how we go about trying to solve them, uh, how it's changing the ways in which we go about things and the ways we go about trying to make our society better. But then also working on the second problem, which I'm here to talk to you about today, which is how the rise of social media can better allow us to actually research society, better allow us to understand how society works, can allow us to better expose all the processes and tipping points and dynamics which we know to be present in society. So for those four and a half years, we've been working as a kind of trunk, central preoccupation at Demos on, and again, quite a strange thing for the think tank to be doing, on the question of social media research methods. When we first began this, we, we went around all the government departments and we said, look at all this data that now exists around social media. Look at all these new ways of learning about people. This is a pivotal shift in social science. This is a generational challenge for social scientists. We need to get on top of this. We need to start leveraging all these amazing new data sets for public decision making. And the same answer came back to us time and time again. This is not robust enough. We cannot trust this. How do we know uh, that this is, this is uh, the kind of evidence and the kind of research which we can actually base really important public decisions on? Decisions which might well be a matter of life and death. Certainly decisions which might be a matter of a small fortune. So from that time till today, we've been working on that very question. How do we actually get insight from social media data sets which can allow you to actually make decisions from? How do you do this kind of research in ways which are robust and trustworthy and transparent? Um, one final side about, about Chasm and Demos before I move on. Our kind of other kind of, as we started working on this problem, of course, of how do you actually research social media when it's robust, we knew that at the very heart of it, and I know this is a watchword which is often thrown around academic circles quite, with quite relative abandon, is we actually need to do something which, in practical terms, is incredibly difficult, and that is interdisciplinary work. We knew that in order to actually start building methods which could be used for public decision making, we actually needed to wrap two very different kinds of disciplines together. They spoke different languages, they had different ways of going about the research, they had different ways of even thinking what evidence was in the first place. It was social science with data science, data analytics. So CASM was formed basically as a partnership between two different kinds of research. Uh, researchers like me, drawn from the social sciences, I used to be an academic before I was a think tanker, mainly based at Demos, and then data scientists, software engineers, natural language processing experts, visualisation specialists, primarily based at the University of Sussex. And since then, we've been trying to do social media research with quite a lot of different kinds of end user in mind. So sometimes we work with directly work for government departments, trying to do things directly of concern, directly of interest for departments like the Home Office, departments like DFID. Sometimes we work with media outlets. I'm particularly keen on trying to get as much kind of digital research, as much social media research as I can in, the, in front of as many people as I possibly can. So we work with the BBC, we work with the Sunday Times, just finished working with the Irish Examiner, covering the Irish general election over there. And sometimes we, we work with, um, we are funded by uh, academic institutions as well, including the NSRM, also the ESRC, uh, charities like Nesta. Uh, and sometimes we work with commercial companies as well. So the social media platforms sometimes fund us to do work, um, especially Facebook. Uh, and sometimes we work with kind of commercial outlets such as Ipsos Mori, the, the commercial pollsters. Now, I'm here to talk about methods. So I'll begin with the problem which I think has underlain 
all the method, all the ways of us trying to do research on social media data sets. And it is, it is that. As we began looking at social media data sets, we knew that we faced, as social scientists, a huge problem. The problem was that we were suddenly faced with data sets which were too large for us to ever manually read or manually analyse ourselves. This kind of step change in the amount and kind of data which we had available to us was very much a double-edged sword. Yes, we could collect 10 million tweets. Yes, we could analyse millions and millions of Facebook posts. We could draw together digital data sets from around the kind of social web very, very easily and, and straightforwardly and, and, and usually for free. But the issue was that we couldn't do a survey on a million tweets. We couldn't run a questionnaire on the same amount. The conventional ways of understanding society simply couldn't cope with the scale and the kind of data which we needed to uh, analyse. So I think across social media research, whether it's the kind of methods I'm going to talk to you today or other groups which are doing loads of un other interesting things as well, I think the same reaction to this problem of scale of data has, has been across all of them, that in one way or another, in one sense or another, it's always been about trying to transfer the analytical burden of analysing social media data sets, of, an, of analysis in general as part of the research loop, away from manual analysts and onto automated and computational processes that can actually handle the amount of data <coughs> that you really need to. And whether it's in what I'm talking about or others, whether it's in natural language processing or network analysis or, or, or knowledge discovery or data mining, it's always been basically about that. How do you try and teach computers to do what once manual researchers used to do, what once manual analysts used to do? Now, in that, on that problem then, the problem of trying to get computers to do what human analysts used to do, of course we needed to start importing all these new, sometimes very unfamiliar, sometimes quite arcane, and certainly for me very difficult to understand technologies, this new body, this new family of kind of muscular big data analytics technologies into the social scientific work which we were actually doing. So suddenly we were having to try and make sense of what these all technologies, what on earth they actually did. What on earth were they measuring? What were the new problems for research in the way in which these technologies worked? What assumptions did they have built into them? What hidden pitfalls existed in using these technologies which might have output results or might have produced metrics or counts which we couldn't actually have possibly uh, could, could have understood or, or could have identified? All of this is absolutely vital. If you're standing in front of a minister or you are a researcher in the government department that needs to put their name to that work and needs to be sure that the research they've done, the insight that they've created, that window in society that they've, they've put together is actually a true one, is a robust one. Um, and one of the problems with, 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 with this, with this endeavour was that the kinds of technologies often that were being used to an analyse social media in general being thrown at these new data sets were, were black boxes. This is, I think, a cross-cutting and systemic problem with the use of these kind of technology in this area. By black boxes, I mean we couldn't look inside them. So they did something, and what they did was incredibly mysterious. So you'd plug in some data, you'd press a button, some other graphs or data would come out the other side. But fundamentally, that actual process of what was being analysed and how remained a mystery to those that weren't inculcated and indoctrinated into the mysterious world of data science. It certainly remained a mystery. So one of our kind of main coal faces has been to try and open up that black box, to try and put some light into black box analytics to try and really make as clear as possible for social scientists what is actually happening when you do big data analysis. So what filters are being applied on the data, what the data set actually looks like itself, and then actually what the act of analysing or making observations from very large data sets really means. And in trying to give as much kind of visibility to this process as possible to social scientists, it's also trying to expose the science, social scientists all the vulnerabilities and risks of doing this new kind of research and what they really are. And, and identifying those risks and, 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 and foregrounding the vulnerabilities to begin to actually carefully and in detail work through them, to begin to work out how you can manage them, begin to work out how you can intervene, all begin to work out how you can communicate as clearly as possible in the research that you do what all these new risks and problems really are. Now, the technology I've chosen to talk to you about today, um, and one of the main ones that we, we use when we do our analysis, is natural language processing. Who's heard of that? 
Good. I'm glad not many. Natural language processing is, your, is, is going to become one of the most important technologies for social scientists dealing with large data sets in the years ahead. Now, this is the quantitative part. In a minute, I'm going to talk about the qualitative part. Natural language processing began in kind of obscurity in the 1970s. It was quite a weird part of mathematical linguistics. It was linguists trying to understand how language worked uh, and how it could be analysed, essentially mathematically. Now, ever since natural language, that is people chatting to each other, exploded in digital form with the rise of social media, natural language processing has been thrust into the spotlight. It's part of something I think most of you will know, which is machine learning. It is the way of teaching computers how to understand and differentiate and categorise natural language. Now, every year, the major natural language processing machine learning conferences double or treble in size. Google employs, by some accounts, about 20% of the world's natural language processing experts and are hungry to snap up as many more of them as they possibly can. Natural language processing machine learning are, are I think, currently still relatively hidden, but, but absolutely, in my world, exploding in importance. And I think that you will see natural language processing, often abbreviated to NLP, become more and more visible in, in, in the journals that you read and the work that you do in the years ahead, because it allows you to do exactly that. It allows you to begin to transfer the analytical burden of crunching through all that natural language, all those tweets, all those posts, all those cat pictures, and begin to actually teach computers to begin to do what you would normally do in much smaller bodies of content, begin to actually analyse and categorise them. And the way that we often use natural language is to build the classifier. Now, the classifier is an algorithm. It's based on maths. It's based on Bayesian maths. And the classifier, if you imagine that deluge, that rushing river, that dam that has burst, all that social media data that's exploded out, well, the classifier is like a sluice gate. The classifier is what you use to begin to control that deluge. It allows you to start uh, creating smaller, more manageable rivulets from that, from that rushing torrent. It allows you to start looking into that torrent and basically beginning to say, well, how can I begin to divide this up in a way which is meaningful to me? How can I begin to identify the relevant data within here to my research question? How can I begin to make analytically meaningful distinctions between the data which sits within here? How can I separate one kind of cat picture from another kind of cat picture? All of that natural language processing through the classifier allows you to do. So it is your window, or it's certainly a window that we use, into data sets, which you just can't read through, you can't scroll through. There's no immediate, direct or raw way for you to get much of an idea of what that data set actually contains. It is too large, and it's too dynamic, and it's too rich, and it's too linked. Now, unhappy Apple, the way in which natural language processing is often used, and now I'm going to begin to, to to start talking about how we begin to fissure this into social science and into qualitative work. Now, we began looking at natural language processing. We began trying to work out how can we use this in a way which is socially, scientifically robust. Well, first we looked at how natural language processing was being more broadly used within this kind of work. And it was being used in a way we thought actually offended some basic social scientific principles. And the, one of the ways it was being used, and one of the most important ways of being used to do this, was in generic classification. Now, has anyone here heard of sentiment analysis? Sentiment analysis, the, the, the I love Nike, I hate Nike, I love this brand, I hate that brand. That, the sentiment analysis grew up from the marketing and advertising industries. It, was, it, it basically relies on natural language processing. But it's the application of this kind of technology, I think, in ways which don't make any kind of sociological sense. The reason why is that you create a generic classifier that you train on as much data as you possibly can, uh, and then you try and push all new data through that classifier. Now, not only is this actually very difficult to make work in any kind of accurate way, because social media use uh, and the language used within social media is incredibly event specific, and the meaning of certain words are incredibly contextual and surging and organically changing all the time. But now beginning to talk about grounded theory a bit, and I profess I'm no great expert in grounded theory, but simply one who's trying to use some of its principles in this kind of research, is that it seemed to us like using these kind of generic classifiers, even if you could get them accurate and you really can't, is you're trying to crowbar data which you actually don't have never seen into a series of preconceived categories that you want to split them up into. Now, that doesn't make any sense from a machine learning point of view, because it's very difficult to 
uh, accurately classify data like this. But it also doesn't make any sense, I think, from a sociological point of view, because you actually miss the categories that are present in the data itself. You're not actually dividing the data up into the different categories which the data suggests that you should divide it up. It is, the, I think, the, the epitome of the application of pre -con analyst preconception on a particular data set. So for all these reasons, we didn't think these kinds of pre-baked algorithms would work at all when it came to trying to understand social media data. So instead, we built a technology called Method 52. One of the first funding of this, thank you very much, was the NCRM, which began to set this process off. And the whole point of Method 52 was to allow us to build bespoke cat uh, classifiers, and especially to allow social scientists to build bespoke classifiers, subject matter experts, on any particular data set that they wanted to. So this is me. I was uh, doing, a project, uh, doing a project for Step Up to Surf. Do you remember that? It was a way of trying to get half of young people to uh, uh, volunteer in their community by, by 2020, I think. And I thought it would be really cool to build a pledgeometer on Twitter. So Step Up to Surf campaign, loads of publicity, um, all party leaders involved, Prince Charles involved, big launch at the palace, big press campaign. And it was asking people to use the hashtag I will to um, pledge if they were either going to do social action themselves or if they were going to help others to volunteer in their local community, social action as well. And I thought it would be really cool to build a pledgeometer. So as each new pledge comes in over the day, I would bring them all in, I would analyse them using natural language processing, and each time I could <laughs> see a pledge, I'd make the counter go up. So people could log on to the website in the day and see how many pledges were given. The issue, of course, is that, is that people were using Twitter for loads of other reasons other than the single reason that people wanted them to. So yes, there were pledges, but there were also people just simply raising awareness about the campaign. Oh, great to see Step Up to Serve launching today. Wish them all the best of luck. They weren't pledges. They were just people talking in a nice way or in, in very small cases a not nice way about the campaign. But there were also uh, completely irrelevant tweets in there as well. Body Armour, which makes sportswear, also had the hashtag I will. They were la launching some kind of running tracksuit. So I needed to build a classifier to begin to separate every single tweet into one of these three categories. Those were the pledging, those that were raising awareness, and those that had absolutely nothing to do with the research question in hand. And crucially, I think, and this is where, really, I think, this is where we begin to try and th start threading grounded theory methodology into the work we do. Crucially, this came out of an interaction we almost always try and have with, with the data that we have. So rather than trying to crowbar it into preconceived Categories. You might consider this to be like the step one of grounded theory, where you're coming up with the initial codes of your data. It might not be abstracting theory up the top of it, but it's, it's the first step, which is you always look at the data and you ask, what categories are naturally present in this data set? Well, in that previous data set, it was quite clear there were some natural categories. There was body armour that I never expected to be in there. Well, that's a natural category. And there was the awareness raising, and then there was the pledges themselves. So you ask, what categories are present in the data set? And you ask, well, what categories do I need to split my data set up into? And you very iteratively, and we, we do this across all the research that we do now when we build these things, we very iteratively and quickly move back between those two things. So we change the research question to suit the data. We try and see to what extent our data fits into our research question. And from that kind of quite flexible and iterative process where we dump categories all the time, oh, this algorithm is not working at all, we need to build another one, oh, we need to add in a new category because suddenly there's a new piece of data which has been added. From that, we try and drag out codes which might not be perfect grounded theory methodology. No, they absolutely might not be. But at the very least, what we try and do is we try and reflexively try and bring, allow the data to suggest to us what codes we really need to use. And that's what we build our, our natural language processing classifiers with. So basically, jump back to the screen a second, we then actually annotate each tweet. So we click this button. This goes into feeding the algorithm underneath it. And the algorithm begins to say, oh, look, OK, so you've told me this one is pledge. You've told me that one's awareness. You've told me that one's about body armor. Well, I'm beginning to spot the linguistic correlations between these categories. Everyone that seems to be talking about body armor or sportswear seems to be in the irrelevant category. People that are saying things like, I will, or I'm going to, or I pledge to, well, they seem to be in the pledge category. And great to see and, and, and a great achievement and all the rest of it. Well, they tend to be in the awareness category. And it's through this process of annotation, not only that we actually get sight of the data, not only that we uh, work out what categories to use, but how we actually train the algorithm itself. This is machine learning. So underneath all of this is a rumbling algorithm, which is bringing in, sucking in 
these, this training data that we've created and working out, well, OK, so this is actually what I need to do with this data. So underneath this is a kind of evolving empirical view of the relationship between the language contained within, in this case, tweets and the, and the categories which I'm asking my algorithm to split all my tweets into. Probably running out of time in a, sec in a minute, aren't I? Yeah. So we, um, and then lastly, we connect these, cat these classifiers up. So each one is quite stupid, each algorithm, but you can collect one up to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. One might be cleaning the data, one might be separating it in one way, one might be separating it with another. And you can begin to build cascades, kind of analytical pathways, which whilst each classifier itself is actually pretty, pretty stupid, together they can make uh, a more interesting decision. So lastly, um, Lastly, here's an example of us doing this. Um, here's the Telegraph. Uh, we worked with the Telegraph during the general election, the seven-way leaders debate. So we wanted to turn the kind of raw and the cheers and the jeers and the digital crossfire of Twitter into, into a rapidly updating metric that people could watch as they were watching the leaders debate itself. So these, these lines were crawling, the worm was crawling across the page and we would brought in every tweet and we built classifiers to analyse them and for each of these colours, as that candidate either got more cheers or boos on Twitter, so their line went up or down. Um, the higher it went, the more cheers they got relative to boos, the lower, the more boos. You can see here's Nicola Sturgeon creeping around. She did something that I'd never seen any politician do actually get over 50%. And you can see deep troughs of disapproval for poor old Mr Nigel Farage there. Uh, pretty much every time he got up to speak, actually, there was, a, uh, <laughs> there was quite, a lot of, quite a lot of criticism. Uh, that was the lowest moment of the night was when he, uh, was when he called the audience lunatic lefties in the room. Um, but then lastly, we, we also, as we were looking at the data, saw that there were actually other, loads of other really interesting categories. So, so p personality or politics was one we got just through looking at how people were actually talking and engaging on Twitter during the debate. And you can see that there are some people that, basically we saw that people were either talking about uh, each candidate in a way which was about politics, so the policies at stake, the stats, the figures, you know, or they were talking about things in terms of personality, how they looked, how they sounded, how they stood, you know, Farage frothing at the mouth, um, that, all that kind of thing. And so we built an algorithm on the fly and then found out that most people were talking about personality, really, as you'd expect, I suppose, in a leadership campaign. Um, final thing, so Demos, as I said, is, a, is technically a public education charity. We publish almost all the work that we do. Um, and we published a lot on social media research methodology. Um, so anyone interested, it's all available for free on the website. Uh, if anyone is specifically interested in the interaction between big data analytics and social science and social scientific principles, um, you might, this might be the only time anyone has actually gone from an audience I've been in to actually read this paper, because I don't think this has ever been read by anyone that isn't myself. Uh, if, if anyone's really keen for 120 pages of dense methodological speculation, God, it's like a perfect audience for me. Uh, there's, a, there's a paper I just wrote called The Road to Representativity, which is about how you can uh, analyse social media data sets in a way which is more representative of uh, both s online activity, but also the society as a whole. And that's us comparing lots of online and offline data sets together, us, me and the head of digital research, Ipsos Mori, to see uh, exactly in what ways social media research is unrepresentative and what we can do about it.